Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. Hope you are well. My name is Colin Moriarty. Today I'm joined by a very special guest, someone I've wanted to speak with on the show for a while. We've talked back and forth behind the scenes, but... I wanted him on the show to talk about the uh, intersection of politics and games, which is something we like to tackle on Sacred Symbols Plus quite often. Noam Bloom, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? All right. How's it going, Colin? I'm all right. Colin. It's uh, it's good to be here with you. You and I were um, talking a little bit about, before we were recording just a moment ago, about our names and how people call us the wrong name. And I was saying that (laughs) Colin Powell ruined my life when when he was in the Bush administration because... uh, just col- just bombarded with colons forever. But um, and I was asking you about your name and I was saying it more. I was removing a vowel, basically, when I was saying a little it. bit. Yeah, it's, uh, everyone knows my name mostly because of uh, Chomsky, who does pronounce his first name Gnome. Right. And so people tend to assume that's the, the correct way. Um, but yeah, it's more it is more Noam, which is more the sort of Israeli type uh, pronunciation of it. Right. Well, very nice. Um, my friend, I appreciate you being here. I've been interested in you for a while because you and I kind of seem like, I don't know, I don't know how to put it, like kindred spirits in a way. (laughs) I don't know if you get that vibe too, but I get that vibe from you. I'm just following you on Twitter, kind of following your work and your vibe. Um, You're a nerd, but you're not really very well known. It's kind of like you're kind of the mirror image of me. We're both very wonky political people and we're both nerds. At least this is the way I encounter it. Game nerds and culture nerds. But you are known more for the politics, less for the games. I'm known more for the games, less for the politics. And I see a mirror image in you on social media, and I find you funny. I find you interesting. And um, I find your whole story quite fascinating as well. So I want, I want to introduce you to the audience just so they get a, a taste of who you are. Um, and uh, so I do appreciate at the very top you doing the show because um, it's not ne- necessarily a natural fit for this show, but I think it's going to be a great episode. I yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree with you. Like, I've, 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 I've wanted to, to come on one of on this or the other show for, for a while. And uh, it's, it's funny that you say that I'm more known for the politics because, yeah, my Twitter story is that I, I for years, I kind of, quote unquote, toiled in anonymity, just talking about anime mostly, not even uh, games as much. Uh, and then just right up in the lead up to the 2016 election, a couple of political things that I tweeted went like super viral. And that was the end of it. And, you know, like was like skyrocketed all of my political type following and the rest kind of fell by the wayside, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, by the way, I just totally forgot to start Zoom. So I'm starting it now. I already have a backup recording, so I'll have the audio. But oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, I was so excited to talk to you. I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. But I, <laughs> it is funny. I, w- I want to ask you about that real quick, because what was it like losing your anonymity? That was a that's when I first started talking to you, I think, a little bit behind the scenes, because I thought that that was fucked. Um, and I don't like that. I like I like the idea of people being able to operate in their own spaces on the Internet. I think that's what's fun about it. You know, you be yourself or you be someone else or you say things from that point of view. What what was that whole that whole situation like for you? Just uh, uh, out of curiosity. OK, so, uh, you know, and then for the in the in this for the sake of propriety, I don't really uh, I don't really go into a lot of detail. You know, I could spend lots of time just like a trash in the person and whatever. But instead, I'll just I'll just say that uh, I was I had wanted to transition to, uh, you know, being non anonymous for a while, uh, didn't really know how to go about it. And, uh, and yeah, the it was it was troubling to have it done, not on my terms and not in the way that I wanted. But I had already taken pre steps in the several years beforehand to ensure kind of a soft landing like I was, I was pretty open with uh, bosses that I'd worked for, because I didn't want to put them in an awkward position. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, for example, like a place that I'd worked for at, at some point when I was a pseudonymous and, and relatively big, I sat down with the guy who ran the organization and I said, you know, I just want you to know that I tweet anonymously and I don't, don't want anything to come back to, to, to bite you if anything happens because you know how the internet is. And so I was, uh, I was forthright. My family knew who I was and a lot of my friends and stuff. And so it, it wasn't this kind of – I always said that um, I wasn't anonymous in the sense that I was unaccountable because that's usually when people say you're anonymous. They mean you can say whatever you want and there it's never going to come back to haunt you. But my bosses knew about my tweets, my family and my real life friends knew about my tweets. The consequences facing me, if I don't know, called somebody a racial slur or said something like that would be effectively equal 
if I had been using my real name at the time. And so it wasn't, I wasn't just using this as a cover to go about and do whatever. Um, and so, but yeah, I, uh, I think I transitioned relatively well. I'm still a little, I still feel a little awkward. Some guy approached me on the street the other day. I was walking my dog in the morning and I was half asleep in my pajamas. And some guy walked up to me and said, are you, are you neon taster? And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, I recognize your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. I love, I love the, 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 the uh, daily images you put up of, uh, it's Yoko, right? Yes, I, it is. Is that right? Yeah. Daily Yoko. As I have, as I, and, uh, I love that. I, 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 I don't know. There's something because I, I love my dogs too, Russian treble. There's something about you that I find just um, super interesting because I feel like there's such a wonderful nexus to explore between games and politics and nerd culture and politics and the intersection of them. And I, especially with Gamergate, um, you know, several years ago being blamed for all the fall, you know, the downfall of the Democratic Party and the beginning civilization of in general. <laughs> I know it's insanity. And, and um, we're a really empowered group of people that I don't think either understand, know, or agree with the fact that we have this outward power in society. But I want to ask you just a high level question. I'm curious how you answer it. What do you think, where does, where, where do games and politics intersect? Like, what do you think the natural intersection is of the, of these two mediums or these two, I guess, bubbles? Because to me, it seems pretty natural that a work of art would be political. And so there would, that would like a black hole, bring all of that in with it. My problem, though, with the intersection is that it just seems all one sided. It's not very interesting because it's just so subsumed by specific ideologies. So I'm just curious at a high level. Do you feel that there's a natural intersection there? And, and how do you feel like it, what it, what is it and, and how is it going? Well, like you said, I mean, uh, it's it, you know, it's art and art and politics always intersect. And especially it's becoming so much more uh, popular and ubiquitous and the, there is no more the stereotype of the gamer as opposed to the member of society who is not a gamer. You know, the average American gamer is like 35. There's 200 million American adults that play video games to some extent or another. It is no longer some kind of like typecast, uh, small insular click. It is people. It is TV. It's movies and it's music. Um, uh, the problem was, like you said, that, that for a long time, there was this sort of monolith of certain kinds of political expression getting, uh, praised and other kinds getting frozen out and criticism of which things, uh, were okay and not okay were frozen out. And yeah, that's, that brings up the whole Gamergate thing, which, you know, unfortunately still <laughs> is still the thing people cite for every new disaster oh we can trace it all back to gamergate for it's, it, reason. it's so weird isn't it i mean it's so it's so strange to empower something like that but my theory about it is that it's used as a scapegoat whatever this amorphous gamergate thing was i wasn't really a participant um, i was at ign at the time so we were scared <laughs> but uh my whole my whole theory of the case when i was at ign and senior editor was like let's not say anything let's not do anything they didn't listen to me so that made it worse for them but my theory of the case here is that it's easy to kind of in, in society as a whole, you kind of still have these delineations between normalcy and not normal. You know, your, your athletes, for instance, versus your nerds that play D&D &D or whatever. That's more acceptable, but there's still a, a stigma attached to that. And a lot of people are not associated with it in gaming in general. So it's easy to kind of other them and then say like, oh, yeah, there's some crazy heinous shit going on over here. And that's the blame for everything. And that's the reason this is. And no one will really be able to check that because they weren't there. So now they have to just read people's takes on it and get people's opinions and these false histories. So it's just very strange. But you're so well connected in the political world or much better than I am. I'm curious. Do do does anyone give a fuck about gaming culture in in politics? Like, is it as, is, is it as empowered within as it seems to be outside? Not directly. It's not, nobody's thinking, oh, the gamers are going to do this or the gamers are going to say that. You know what I mean? It's just that um, I, I do think that there is a desire, uh, different places that I've gone through because my my career basically evolved into this idea of like a lot of people, especially more like on the right side of things, uh, woke up slower than most other people to the need for like the, to be on the, in the digital space and to communicate in the digital space in its own terms. And by that, I mean stuff like memes and stuff like giving your social media accounts a voice and sounding less corporate and more personal. And now everybody wants that where, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of more stuffy conservative type places didn't know why they would even need that. 
and uh, and yeah, there is a there is this sort of desire to uh, penetrate that uh, market, not even in in capitalist terms, just to sort of to to crack that sort of nut of the culture of people and what they like and how they think and how you can relate to them. And there still is a gulf. I mean, the, the you still have this like the violent video game. Uh, horseshoe thing that comes from both sides every time there's some kind of mass shooting and they say the shooter played video games, you know, which used to be this kind of, it, it used to be a data point. It's no longer really a data point because there's so many people who do it. And you said there's athletes and there's data, but the athletes also love right. to play Halo or Call of Duty or that's the thing that's different now. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, you had this, this kind of a very stark delineation of who had a gaming console in their house. Now it's practically anybody. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because though we like to, in our more hardcore spaces, judge the everyone is a gamer mantra. And I've, do, I've done it in the past, right? Like, mm -hmm. because it's like, you know, most of the gamers in the world are women. I mean, I remember, I remember they, people used to say that shit because it would like combine hardcore stats and iPhone and stats crush, and PC and, yeah. and far. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And it's like, come on, man. We know that this is nonsense, but I do like the idea of kind of setting the seeds of of culture within gaming that's that's fun and um and quirky and meme centric and all of this through normal people. The idea though that I think that they're being politicized by all this, I think is strange. Do you think that do you think people are being politicized by video games and video game culture? Uh, culture maybe yes. I don't think anybody's becoming radicalized by a video game. <laughs> You know what I mean? Especially not in an abstract way because there, you know, because th this goes back to the Jack Thompson era of the idea of like you playing a violent video game makes you violent. And we know that there was uh, this, there was always a thing that this was pinned on. It was video games and it was heavy metal and it was TV and it was books. You know, a hundred years ago, the newspaper would say, kids, they're spending too much time indoors reading those damn books. They should be outside. There's always a thing. There's always something that like, adult. it's generational, right? Adults don't understand the new hot thing that they do. And it's different from how they spent their time. And so then every negative thing you see in the new generation, you kind of attach to that thing that they do that you didn't. And now it's the internet and now it's gaming. But soon, pretty soon, we're going to have a president of the United States that that has who has a video game that he loves, that he adores and played as a kid. And when the new video, there's going to be a news cycle. I don't, maybe we'll live to see it and maybe not. I think we probably will. Where some new video game will come out, like the latest Zelda game will come out. And because the president is a huge Zelda fan, there's going to be a news cycle about how the president's going to play the new Zelda game on his Switch 4 or whatever. Yeah, the totally. You're totally time. right. It's so right. funny. We'll, we'll, have a pre we'll have a president with a gamer tag. Yeah, we're going to get there. <laughs> like there was because there was a whole thing about the president doesn't have a computer. The president doesn't have a phone. Then Trump was a president who lived on his phone. Right. We regressed a little back now with the president who that probably doesn't do that. But but we're it, it's the tide of history. You're slowly moving towards, you know, we're going to have I always joke about how, you know, in the in the future, uh, finding an old picture of grandma is going to be her doing like a keg stand on Instagram. Right. Where it used to be <laughs> like a, it used to be like, oh, look, it's grandma in the 20s. Yeah. Nah, nah, nah. You know, it's like a little wholesome like party. And now right. it's all like <laughs> it's going to be her selfies at, at, at on spring break. Yeah, uh, it'll be awesome. It'll humanize her to her to her to her uh, <laughs> predecessors, which I think is uh, or her successors, I should say, which is uh, which is interesting. I love the idea that you brought up with the books because you can see this this through line where the next generation wants you to do the previous thing instead of the current thing. And it happens over and over again, where the previous thing becomes what they want you to do. Yeah. So you can imagine it's like, Oh, books. No, 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 don't, don't, you know, go outside. And then, and then all oh, the kids are listening to the, to the music and they're going to the, to the club and the speakeasy. You got to go. Why don't you get inside and read some books? Right. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, move on and on and then movies. It's like, Oh, why don't you go listen to some music? Like, like we used to do. And then TV, it's like, well, what, what about film? Right. And so on and so forth. And I think it's so funny that that's that is a thing. Yeah. And um, 
and then I'm a little you, you judging know, like, myself about it by the way like it's like i i want people to play games so i'm i'm judging in the other way but i'm sorry i interrupted you, what would you no but and then and no and then when we're gonna be old uh crotchety old men we're gonna say when i was a kid we didn't put it we didn't plug our spine into the virtual reality we sat down on the couch and played a video game and we're aware of our surroundings you know it's always like the, the like you said the last thing always seems like more quaint and wholesome than the new thing that everybody's doing um, and yeah, yeah, like you said, politics, unfortunately, or fortunately or whatever is, is, in, is definitely intertwined in there. Um, the, the, it's the thing, it's the idea that Gamergate was the blueprint for everything that goes on. That's very funny to me. There is some kind of weird logical progression that they use to justify this because Steve Bannon used to be at Breitbart and uh, Neil Milo used to be at Breitbart. And so he took all wow. of that. And yeah. built a built a playbook out of it or something like that. There is some kind of conspiracy theory as to how that happened. But what people don't remember is Gamergate wasn't even the first one. There was like a thing, like I think Elevator Gate was the first one, the which was like a, a similar thing to Gamergate that happened in the atheism community. It was a big controversy that kind of tore the athe- atheism community apart because of like sexism allegations. It had to do with Rebecca Watson. It's a story nobody remembers now. Yeah, I don't remember this a- at all. So there was a- at an atheism conference, somebody asked Rebecca Watson out in an elevator and made her very uncomfortable. And she wrote a post about it. And that was it. There was like a huge... <laughs> <laughs> blow up lots of people like uh like demonstrably like left the atheism movement on it and that was like that was before the big gamergate thing wow. and then after gamergate there was a thing like that in science fiction where the hugo awards had a whole sad puppy slate and then they didn't give out any awards and every sub community like this had a little bit of a thing anime had a whole slew of controversies relating to content to terminology that you use to translate things from just from japanese into english it was just i think that in the in obama's second term something happened where like there wasn't a lot to talk about he had gotten reelected and he was going to have his second term and so then a lot of cultural issues that were that never got a lot of play got tons of national play somebody got harassed on the internet and then they would go on like 60 minutes like right. As though now now somebody getting a bunch of harassment and like in DMs, that's not nobody even talks about that. And then it was like they go on the news. They have like a whole half hour magazine piece written about how people were mean to them on Twitter. Um, and so, yeah, it's it, I just don't understand why uh, people don't see this as just another data point in like a general culture thing that kind of erupted where there was a dominant political force in all of culture. And a lot of people who weren't cool with that slowly understood that they had other people that they could kind of connect with and create this kind of countervailing cultural force. And yeah, there was lots of harassment and lots of trolls jumped on it because it was a big internet thing. But in general, what happened was you had these like pipelines of uh, that didn't have to go through these political clicks and now yeah lots of people don't go to ign or they don't go to uh, uh wired or kotaku or polygon they have their youtubers that they like they got their tweeters that they like often who are ideologically at odds with you know the people behind those things and they got their own places like it's not the there is no gatekeeping anymore yeah, I, I love that. I mean, it was the I saw I was at IGN from 2002 to 2014 in some capacity, all the way to senior editor from freelancer and intern. And watching us kind of rise and fall from within was interesting and not really seeing the fall until I was leaving and left and realized how static they were. I say you wouldn't know this because uh, but I say this on my show sometimes that I'm so surprised when I worked at IGN, I had a massive Ron Paul for president sign on my desk. Like we had like the we had, you know, our cubicles and you had your little cabinets. And on top of it, I had a massive Ron Paul 2008 sign and I had a, a bumper sticker on my on my desk that said honk if I'm paying your mortgage. And the O in the honk was Obama's M.O. symbol. And no one gave a fuck that those things were there. And it it's crazy how I'm telling you, I was there forever. Like we people would we would talk politics. We have but it was very friendly, cordial place and i always think about that because i'm like this isn't i wasn't just like you know oh mccain or i didn't like these. i was more like a you know kind of more of in the libertarian slant so a little more off the off the reservation and they didn't care about that at all 
And then you fast forward 10 years and I'm not even allowed in 2018, 2019, when I asked to use their podcast space, I'm not even allowed to go there. Like they're like, I'm not, you're not really welcome here. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I was your guy once and you're the ones I think that changed. And I think that it was Gamergate that really undid a lot of people, but I'm curious how would you define Gamergate if you had to? I'm always fascinated by asking people this. Like, how would you, what, what, what would you term it as and how would you kind of explain it to someone? Well, the problem is the, uh, the, the definition of it evolved. And I think a lot of people jumped ship when that happened. When it, be, when it, it mutated into becoming an identity and a self-identifier was when a lot of people were like, no, no, no. At first, because, you know, any gate thing starts as some kind of controversy. Now, initially, it was a name that was used to describe a very specific controversy, a very specific claim about a very specific person. We don't, we, we do we want to like, do we want to name names here? A claim you could, was, you could say whatever you want on the show. Okay, fine. A, a claim was made against an independent game developer named Zoe Quinn uh, that she was essentially sleeping around to get good press. And the theory had whatever it had its its evidence whether you support it or not. But the, a lot of the evidence behind it was there was this click. There was a click of indie game developers, and there was a click of writers, gaming writers, and they were all friends. And a lot of them gave good press to their friends. And there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a culture of disclosure at the time. And so claims of impropriety were raised. And then it, uh, the 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 way to combat them instead of saying it's not true or whatever was to launch like a full scale cultural assault and say this is all this is all misogyny and harassment and whatever. And then no matter what then came up because the in the in the in the following months, like essentially like I said, a culture of this clickishness became apparent. There were more data points, IGDA, the Independent Game Developers Association, and their ties to all of these people, and who was getting awards at indie uh, uh, award shows, and who was friends with who, and who was not appraised of who was friends with who. And any attempt to raise any of those issues was just called misogyny and racism. And no matter if the people saying it were themselves women or uh, people of color or members of the LGBTQ community, which is where the whole not your shield hashtag right. came up. Nobody remembers right. that one, right? But that was the thing. There was a lot of people who were like, stop saying that this is racism. I'm I'm saying this and I'm black or whatever. Um and then again, it just turned into a big culture war, basically. It just turned into the the sort of the progressive people in the gaming world and people who weren't progressive in the gaming world, and they fought about anything. Any new game that came out, any interview that came out, any claim about a thing in a video game because of Anita Sarkeesian and her sexism versus tropes, with tropes versus women in video games. The point was there was two camps were established because of this initial like uh, blow up. And then for a long time, any new thing that happened in gaming had this side comment on it and this side comment on it. And they came to blows over it. That's it. That's how I would explain it to somebody who had no idea about it at all. A big controversy created two camps and then they fought about everything in gaming for like a year. <laughs> right. I, I think that that's generally right on. I think you got a lot of the characters right as well, since we're naming names. <laughs> um, I will say, and I've said in the past, so it's nothing new, but um, I think Lee Alexander is one of the central villains of this story as well. And gamers, she, are she wrote the gamers are dead. They quote because right. that's not what it was, but the quote unquote gamers are dead. Yeah, gamers are not your audience. Gamers are dead or something yes. like that, which is fine. I, I you can write whatever you want. I just wonder how that got through any sort of pipeline, because if I were the EIC at that that institution, I would have been like, well. This is a very tone deaf thing to say right now. Do we really want to throw gas on the fire? And I think if she never wrote that piece, I think this I, I believe that it might have been much more localized than it would have been if not for that stupid article. I mean, that's up to her to write it. But that was why I gave IGN the advice as senior editor at the time, though they I was outvoted. I was I was like, we should just not say anything. And what ended up happening was we instead released some mealy mouthed letter that didn't say anything and got us just everyone hated us after that like on both sides so i was like this is why we didn't want to be involved in that but i think i always think back to a trip i went to in uh, late 2014 to kentucky to do the bourbon trail and there was a guy at a restaurant 
who found out I was in gaming and he asked me to explain. He's like, what's going on with here on an NPR or something? Like, what's, <laughs> what's going on with Gamergate? And I was like, oh my God, I don't know. I don't want to talk about this. And it did become a thing people would ask me about. Like people just in my life that that's must have been what they've been hearing. And I was like, this is such a shame that we're breaking through to the mainstream like this. There's so many great products and so many great revolutions and storytellers and auteurs and all these things. And we're talking about this stupid culture war. And yet we needed to fight it. And I was a victim of the culture war later on, although I made it work for me. You brought up Anita Sarkeesian. I wanted to ask you about her. I've noticed something interesting about her. I wonder if you agree. It seems like she doesn't have many friends anymore. She it seems like every time I see her pop up more and more people that I otherwise would have thought were neutral or maybe even on her side seem to be like, can you just shut the fuck up already (laughs) and move on? And what I thought was really interesting, and I didn't know this, so I I had to do my research. This was only a few months ago that her writer, Jonathan McIntosh, the guy from back on the women's or women versus tropes or whatever, he's like huge, apparently. Yeah, like, like, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I th- yeah, he had his own sort of resurgence, I know, as like his own cultural critic. Yeah, right. And and you can and you, and you kind of look at it and you're like, huh, I always looked at it as him being like the hanger on. And I was I was wondering when, uh, you know, just in my own mind, I'm like, maybe he was the talent behind this. But she was kind of the vanguard of all of this. I find her I really wanted to talk to her. I know that I've talked too much shit to really reasonably reach out to her and ask her to talk to me. I wouldn't talk to me if I if I did that as well. But <laughs> but um. I've, I've never seen someone in my own sphere, in my own ecosystem, so thoroughly work the refs in my entire life and so thoroughly have control over narrative and have giving symposiums at developers, getting paid all this money to go do this and that. Very strange. What do you think of her? And, and, am, and am I right that she seems to be greatly weakened in the modern era? Yes. And it's funny that that you said that because at the time there was a, a trend of saying like that she was his puppet there. I remember there was a meme where he was like puppeting her as like a marionette. And at the time people said, oh, that's so sexist because what the guy controlling. And I even thought that that sounded like ridiculous to me. But now that you say like her now that they split at some point, they split paths. And yeah, he his stuff gets lots of play and her star has like largely faded. And so, yeah, maybe a lot of that. Uh, drive that analytical and creative drive came from him, especially uh, gaming specific, because I do think I don't remember, we don't have to get into conspiracy theories. But I do think there was a thing at the time where her gaming cred was not really legitimate. She had come from some other field and kind of parlayed that into doing it in gaming. And so a lot of her complaints that weren't scripted didn't sound uh, super compelling. And you know, say what you want about Macintosh. At least he like is a consumer of these things and he knows about them and he has been a gamer whole all his life and stuff. And so, yeah, his takes are like flamingly terrible all the time, obviously. I think he recently was complaining about uh, Top Gun. Um, at, like, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying like at least he at least he knows the things that he's discussing. You know, he's still wrong about them, but th- there's there's st- you still understand that this is someone who d- who consumes the media that he's criticizing. I find her interesting too. I was going to ask you about this a little later, but it kind of com- it comes up more naturally now, so I'll do it. I've been fascinated with her kind of um, her more recent, I think, past few years spinoff of trying to kind of deal with online harassment and like having an on- online harassment hotline and all of these kinds of things. And I just don't really understand who the audience is for these sorts of sorts of things. Um, she kind of presents this very precious rendition of a gamer that I don't think is really accurate. You know, I think a lot of people that play games understand what, what it is and love gritty storytelling and understand the competitive nature of multiplayer and all these various things. And someone comes in, I think like her and kind of represents a side of gaming that I think people just don't even represent. I think that's why when she went around the developers talking about her experiences and her thoughts, a lot of people were blindsided and surprised because they never thought about it because it makes no, a lot of it makes no sense. So that's what I thought of a lot of it was. So I'm glad that you said that as well. Like her, her credibility, I hate to put it in such dark terms, but her credibility could have been easily proven by just being like, Oh, look at my achievements or look at my trophies or look at all of my forum posts on these things where I was talking about these things here. But instead, all you had was a weird video from some sort of self-help group where she's, it sounds like she's 
doesn't really understand video games and doesn't play them. So I just thought she was a weird messenger. I wonder why people kind of like it seems like people that have something to say gleam on to the most imperfect messengers. And, and that, by the way, that goes both ways. And I, yeah. I, I say this all the time. I say I don't like wokeness, but there is a very clear uh, anti woke to nut job pipeline Definitely. that really is unignorable and that and it and it and it exists on that exact same level. Uh, people are so dead. Why do you think, again, you want to talk about Gamergate? Why do you think uh, Milo or Milo or whatever her, his name is pronounced, uh, his star rose so quickly? He was the only person anybody could find at the time who had like a platform in a, in a, like a website that a lot of people read who was willing to like write against these people. And so immediately everyone glommed onto him. And uh, even though it was like known that he hated gamers, uh, six months before Gamergate, he was writing articles about how all gamers are terrible and it, that nobody said insult at the time, but that was the implication and that he had found this sort of niche to kind of muckrake because th there was a, there was like a vacuum and they needed someone like that there. But so still, he was like people's hero for like 15 minutes. Um, and yeah, a lot of those same create a lot of the people who brought up Gamergate, like at the time, Internet Aristocrat, who is now called Mr. Medicare. Um, a lot of people like that who are who are uh, sort of controversial, fringy type figures and are there to hit strike while the iron is hot. And uh, and like you said, especially along uh, like a long enough timeline either run out of things to say or, you know, reveal their opinions in other ways that are, are bad. And, you know, may, you maybe don't agree with. I totally agree with you, by the way, there, it seems like culture war issues we're seeing it now with um, the pro-life versus pro-choice stuff, the reasonable middle or whatever, which I think most people are in is never really represented. It's always just the screeching on the sides. And you feel like that's these, these entrenched interests are, are representative of the greater whole. And it's, it typically doesn't work out like that. And and I um I feel like with it's it's good to never drink too much of your own Kool-Aid and to <laughs> be open minded because there really are people that present pre pretend like racism isn't a problem at all. There's no sexism at all. There's not, and it's like, well, of course that's not true. Um, but we don't need to overstate the case either. And I think that's kind of where most people um live now. But I want to ask you, you brought up something, you use a specific word. I'm writing notes as you speak, and you mm -hmm. use the word clickishness which I, I, I clickishness, which I, I like because there is a click developing within games or it has developed. The thing is, is that I used to be like a main character in the click because the click wasn't political. It was really about who like the big voices in the industry were. This was when I was at IGN a long time ago, but I was obviously thrown out uh, of the click because I was the closest thing these people had ever seen to a Trump voter, which is uh, which is what I always say. I'm not even a Trump voter there. I was just too close to a Trump voter for, for their taste. How do you think this clickishness um, not only evolved, but took root in, in our industry? And it seems like it's happening everywhere. So obviously we wouldn't be immune, but it's just so strange that this, um, this very loose, I was there for so long, this very loose industry that was very fun and very young and very vibrant. It became, stilted boring and scoldy and it's it's hard to believe that i was ever, ever even part of it so i'm wondering i love that you use that word click because it just it resonated with me where did this come from uh it, that's a good question i think uh i think there is a, a sort of a revealed preference thing here where it, the situation always existed the thing that didn't exist was the desire to bring the politics into everything in a very present active way because you know, people who are uh, who are in the arts and uh, it, it's there's a geographic and there's like a revealed preference issue. So like people who are young and in L.A. and uh, writing for websites and uh, writing about video games are probably more likely than not to be sort of liberal in their politics and in their policies. Not everyone. But again, we're talking about the tech sector, the gaming sector, and also where it's uh, geographically centered on the coasts and stuff. And so you have this situation where the second this uh, this the the bubbling of like the cultural stuff within all these spheres started to become unignorable, that's when the problem arose. I went to music school in Boston, 
and had no politics at my school. Graduated in 2010. Where'd you go, Berkeley? And, yes. Oh, okay. I went to Northeastern. So, oh, right cool. Oh, so yeah. I was at, yeah. So I was at Berkeley, uh, 2008 to 2010. And I was working at the time for like a Israel advocacy group. And my uh, boss said to me, is there any anti-Israel stuff going on on your campus? And I said, not only is there no anti-Israel stuff, there's no politics at all. People are just playing music. They're focusing on their craft. And I thought that was like the thing. I thought, yeah, sure. Everybody here is uh, working hard towards their goal. But no, like when I left now, like it's a whole thing. There's politics and whatever. And it would have been really hard for me coming especially from a different country like i had i had a, a really different sort of political mind when i came here like i've evolved a lot but um i was i remember feeling very fortunate in college to be some place where everyone was like really good friends and just like f- uh, focusing on the music and it was very diverse and there were people there from africa and from asia and from I- american inner cities and from all of the places in the states from all different socioeconomic classes Nobody really knew if anybody else was rich or not rich. We just played music and had a good time. And I feel like five or six years later, that would have, would have been crushed by like the way reality changed, the way the acceptability, you know, the 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 social acceptability of ignoring politics uh, became lessened. And it was it it was now people actively pursued uh, the politics of the people around them in order to know that they were hanging out with the right kind of people and that the, you know, the people around them knew what was what and were all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I think that's sad. Um, you know, some other people might think it's important because we're in peril and the world is in danger, but I, I don't know that one comes at the expense of the other. I don't know that you need to be uh, purity chasing everywhere because politics is important. It's so interesting knowing now that you went to Berkeley because just down the road at Huntington Avenue, uh, 2002 to 2007, when I was at Northeastern, po- politics wasn't really a thing either, which is insane to say, but it's true. Like there was some anti-war stuff and some gay rights stuff, but the most political things I remember happening there, and I don't know, I, you might, I don't know if you know who this is. Do you know who Lyndon LaRouche is? You know that name? I, the, I know the name. Yes. Yeah. He was like a perennial presidential candidate. I, he, he went to Northeastern. So he and he's like, I don't know what the, he was like, some fucking whack job. But he the most you would see political stuff was like people with tables trying to pimp him at Northeastern. I don't know. I have no idea why I used to get in arguments with him all the time. But it what it didn't. See, I would be very interested to know. I feel like I got out of there in the nick of time, especially studying American history. I, I, that's what's so strange is I just don't remember anyone really getting crazy. And, uh, I don't know if I missed it and I would have enjoyed it more, but I don't think I would have. And I agree with you that politics seem to be like your political leanings in, in the industry anyway, seem to become more and more important. And the couple of people that I give any sort of social credit to that disowned me were the people that did it before everything happened with me. It kind of funny because there were a couple of people I were close to was close to that kind of were like, oh, you're becoming too right wing or whatever. And I, I wasn't. They were just becoming crazy. But I at least appreciate that they didn't do it without any sort of social cost. But that's what I wanted to ask you about next was how do you feel about the association of politics and kind of this this clickishness and this group think with the severe cost that comes with not being involved in that because for instance if i tried to i own my own stu- studio and i own my own company so i can I, we make our own games we have our own podcast and we do great but i could i could never get a job a- at any of these places probably which is insane i'm better at my job than most of these people are at theirs and if you were judging me based on that then of course i would get in but there's a political barrier that can never be overcome and um i'm wondering what do you think of that whole structure I mean, on the one hand, it's terrible, right? But, you know, they say uh, God closes a door and opens a window. You know, you say you, you're you doing well for yourself. It, 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 uh, that, that problem created uh, uh, like restrictions that you then parlayed into something good for yourself. And I do think that ultimately a lot of people built really good careers because they were, you know, unemployable in the classic sector. And have built like YouTube career, you know, you careers as YouTubers or as bloggers or as you know, do whatever it is that their own content is. There are many, many uh, uh, platforms that let you do that. You can crowdfund your games, and you can you have Patreon, 
you can do all sorts of uh, audience building that doesn't have to go through those bottlenecks. That was the beauty. And I also think that was why uh, this was fought against so severely. And, and, and you know, still a big thing to try and do is get somebody kicked off of Patreon, for example. Mm-hmm. Why? Because that's, your, th- that's y- the avenue where you don't depend on them. You don't have to go through their filter in order to subsist doing this for a living. Um, and, uh, I mean, take a a company like daily wire, for example, right. And how their big business plan these days, like the way that they get around, you know, can't cancel culture. I feel lame even saying it at this point, but like the way they get around this problem is that they're branching off. They're essentially becoming their own sponsor. And so what are you going to do? Go after their sponsors. It's their own razor company. That's sponsoring. I I think daily wire is brilliant. I really do. I'm not super into the content. I think it's a little too um, conservative for me in a lot of ways, but I love that they are like, because I was looking when they were going after Matt Walsh's book, the walrus book or whatever that mm-hmm. he wrote, the children's book. Yes. And then I was looking at it and I was like, oh, they publish it, you know, yeah. and, and they're selling it themselves. They're selling it on Amazon too, but there is no there. And they have 300,000 subscribers or something paying every month. And they, whatever the number is, it's insane. I mean, and yeah, yeah the I razor think, thing. I, I thought that was a great idea. I thought it was great. I, I think that they are a model for how it's done, if not in terms of content, in terms of just the put your shoulder into it. And, you know, it's like a it's a it's a classic rotary. It's like, you know, everyone everyone has each other's back and protects each other and voices each other's concerns and brings each other to the forefront and stuff. It's great. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and again, uh, the, the 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 politics of their content aside, because they're also certainly more conservative than I am and also to the right of me on certain things, not just conservative speaking, but, uh, but yeah, like you said, biz- business wise in terms of like a uh, navigating a, uh, a co- the corporate strategy of someone in the political sphere today, uh, there, pr- nobody I think is doing it smarter than they are. They had the, they understand the, the, the minefield that it is to produce sort of politically controversial content and, and make it profitable. And they're addressing those, problems directly you know they're building a minesweeper tank <laughs> to, so, totally. to take them through the minefield um and uh and so do i think that it sucks that someone like me or you or you know someone who is the kind of person who likes me or you can't get a job at kotaku do i think that's bad yeah certainly but I also, but but I feel like in a way that was also the truth before there were alternatives and now there's alternatives and now, you know, every third person who can't get a job at Kotaku will start their own YouTube channel and maybe make a whole big thing that would have been way, that's way better than anywhere they could have gotten, you know, during the standard thing. Totally. And it's it's worth noting that it would be better for Kotaku to hire that person too. Not because they are conservative, let's say, but because it's just, I if I were the EIC or the managing editor, I'd be like, well, I want a variety of people here. I, I, I feel like there are just not enough outlets, none in games, but even in sports, like I think The Athletic does a pretty nice job of it, although I had to unsubscribe from them because the New York Times, I'm not giving the New York Times any money. That's not happening. And, uh, you know, a few other websites, The Ringer and everything, like where there's some different, you know, at the um, Barstool Sports, I think is very attractive because they have like a variety of, of people. I thought it was really interesting, for instance, you know, they, they talk about barstool conservatism, but then Dave Portnoy comes off, comes out with a very strong pro-choice message and keeps people on their heels. I think that's good shit. So there are these people thought it would be pro-life. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah sure I don't know it. why. I mean, that's <laughs> just like, I, I, don't, I don't know that either. That's yeah. very strange. Mm-hmm. But you're right. There are companies that are doing it. And there and I, I always give people advice, too, because when I was an intern at IGN, it, I was like, it was awesome. And that's how I got into the industry. I was a game facts writer before that. And people ask, like, oh, what should I do? How should I get involved? And I'm like, well, you don't want to go to those places. You don't want to. I mean, I guess if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But that's a dead end. You want to do it for yourself now because we went out. Jim Sterling went out and kind of funny went out and all these guys went out and proved you could do it. And Jim Sterling makes more money than anyone at IGN. You know, Um, my editor makes more money than I than I ever made at IGN. And and so I think it's working out in, in dividends that people just have the courage to go out and do it themselves and. And I'm I'm glad to be unencumbered. I also have a great relationship, I think, with, um, you know, people expect it. Like, what if what if Patreon kicked you off or whatever? And I'm like, they're not going to they're they're actually a pretty cool company They're They're not really the ones that are um, the ones you need to worry about. I'm much more worried about YouTube. I'm much more worried about Twitter. I'm much more worried about these other places. But uh, I digress. 
You had brought something up earlier that I wanted to ask you about, which I think is interesting too, which is the idea of localization and editing. This is a, a, a low, a low key, pretty big problem um, in the industry right now. It's an entire Twitter account that I started following dedicated to bad uh, localizations. I don't know if you've seen this. Well, I but, mean, um, this is a yeah, this is a big uh, in, in the intersection of anime and gaming too, yeah. because uh, huge, huge controversies in localization. And as someone who, so I worked for, uh, 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 I was a translator for over a decade, uh, doing Hebrew English translation of all sorts. I did, uh, I did academic stuff, and I did stuff for business. I did subtitling. I did every kind of translation. I translated technical manuals for all kinds of weird things, um, and I also. Uh, speak basic Japanese, like I'm uh, N5 qualified, whatever. I studied Japanese a bunch of that. So I know a little about how Japanese to English translating and localization works in a, in a kind of logistical way. Not well, obviously. I'm not going to correct somebody who speaks Japanese fluently on their things. But just in terms of things like honorifics, things like uh, Japanese puns and how they operate and how you would have to navigate some kind of things like that. And yeah, uh, polit- uh, politically controversial. There are things in Japanese media that Japanese media plays for jokes that here you don't play for jokes. Like, for example, the idea of uh, the wind blowing up somebody's skirt and you see her, she upon her like pants, her striped underwear. Right. That's like the Japanese media equivalent of somebody slipping on a banana peel. Like you see I that see. going back with the 50s and whatever. Now, now you can still argue that it's problematic. The point is like, that's not how it sticks in their brain. Because you could also say it's, the fact that somebody's slipping on a banana peel and falling on their head is funny is terrible. That's violent. Somebody could get killed, right? And if you come from a culture where laughing at somebody's physical misfortune is problematic, somebody slipping on a banana peel would seem like, why would you make fun of that? That's mean, right? right. And so it's there's a cultural difference there because we don't we have we haven't done that for a while, and they do. And so you can still criticize it, but you're you're misunderstanding how it's read there. Um, and so, and now you have this, like th- these politics, this idea of like, oh, this character in this manga is uh, trans, but making her trans would be problematic because they joke about it. So let's just make her a woman instead of a trans man. And then all those jokes done, we'd have to navigate the political, uh, 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 Gordian knot of these being problematic jokes. We'll just change the gender of the character. And a lot of people think that's bullshit, understandably. Um, and, uh, yeah, like you said, it's, there's a whole thing now because a lot of localizers think it's their job to like deproblematize Japanese media. It, it's, um, it's a shame because there were publishers that were known for really rock solid translations. I'm sure, you know, like Xseed and NIS that did really great work. And then I think started to become undone by this click again, click of very politically minded, um, localizers and people you know because you were a translator there's a difference between translation and localization and like you said and you you eloquently put there are reasons that you need to change certain things but you can't change the intent or the meaning for instance changing a character from trans to um a biological woman is the change of a character that a person another person made we don't give a fuck what you think we just want to know what it says you know and if you need to kind of tweak it a little bit I, people when Danganronpa 3 came out I haven't played it yet I only played the first two but when it when it came out people kept tweeting at me because there's a New York Jets joke in there and I think that's really funny that there is a straight up New York Jets joke in there and I wondered what was the in the original it was probably something about a really lowly baseball team or something in in, in Japan but I was like that's the kind of localization that I think is good like understanding it but I don't need you to protect me and my sensitivities necessarily so there's also, there's also something p- cynical, you know, because uh, and, and also like we got to we got to make the tie. Right. Because a lot of these people are also like uh, uh, usually on the left side of the political map. And so they're also more likely to be anti corporate and anti capitalist. And yet they think it's cool for a company to profit off of an inherently problematic piece of media as long as they just clean it up a bit. Right. Right. As opposed to saying, no, this manga is transphobic. Don't localize it at all. You know, it's unethical to to make money off something problematic instead of just being like, no, take a little line item veto, just erase a a word here and there. And now we can profit off of it. I'll buy it. You make money off of it. Everything's great. That's very cynical. It's this idea of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, having your cake and eating it, too, sort of. Sure. Uh, Totally well put. Um, 
Yeah, because they don't want consequences for themselves because they need the job. They want they want the work. They don't want to have things slow down or take a, a stand. It reminds me a lot. I mean, it's a very, very extreme example. But when people are always like, you know, there's not enough you know, a white person will write a Kotaku like, where are the people of color? And, you know, in in games meeting, it's like, well, you if you really gave a fuck, you could sacrifice your very own position. Yes, and, there's and, a lot. There's a lot of that. Yes. Right. The, the these these committees that come out and say, like, there's not enough people of color and the committee itself is fully white, you know, stuff like that. There is a lot of that sort of uh, absurdity. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's just like the idea is. You, it's okay to just say, you know, when uh, when you watch old uh, Looney Tunes uh, cartoons, they come now with a like a splash screen before it, and it says these cartoons are a product of their time. They might contain things, up, but that's it. They just put a thing. They say, look, we're yeah. just showing you a cartoon that came out in 1962 right. with everything that comes with that, you know, and if there's something racist in it, remember that it was made in 19, 1962, and the only reason we're showing it to you because that's how it was made. And I think that's totally fine. Just put that up front. You know, a manga. Say this manga is at, uh, uh, localized as minim in an, uh, as minimalist a way as possible to make it both understandable to Western audiences and retain as much of its original intent as possible. And yes, that might mean that some cultural contexts can be offensive to some people. That's it. Just acknowledge that up front. I don't care. I don't need to blind sign somebody with something they find upsetting. I actually, um, when I played uh, Doki Doki Literature Club, okay, I actually did, I have a YouTube channel. It's kind of small. Um, and I, uh, I, I posted my playthrough of it. I have a thing, something that triggers me kind of is uh, suicide imagery and uh, Doki Doki blindsides you mm. with a suicide thing. And when I live streamed it, I freaked out and you can hear it. I, I get really upset. And then later I calm down and I explain that, look, this is my, this is, this is a me thing. The game has plenty of content warnings. It says it, it, it you know, it tricks you into thinking it's like a cute kind of harem-y uh, uh, visual novel, but it has plenty of like content warnings and I knew something fucked up was going to happen. It still surprised me and I still got so upset I couldn't fall asleep at night. But then I came back and I said, that was my problem. I'm not going to get mad at the game. The game is genius. Yeah, it is. It is a genius game. It I, just I, hit I, me. Yeah, it just right. hit me in a soft spot and it upset me. But not it, that's not its fault. Yeah, out of all of the – I must agree with you in the sense that – and you you present a very convincing case because out of all of the new features of society, the pronouns in your bio, the you know like all the shit that I'm never going to do. The trigger warnings, I think, were the least annoying to me. Always, right? Like, out of all the di different pantheons of, of things we have to worry about now, it's like, well, trigger warnings don't really bother me. I will say, though, about Doki Doki Literature Club, and for those out there that are curious, we did a deep dive Sacred Symbols Plus episode all about that game when it came to PlayStation. Um, I thought it... I, it's interesting to hear your experience because I thought it really betrayed itself by making it so obvious that something fucked up was going to happen. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. That's like fair. I was like, I, I get yeah. it because you don't want, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. I know like, the exact image you're talking about. It's like <laughs> one famous image. Yeah. Um, but I would have loved to have, if my sensibilities would have been like, I would have loved to have played this thing thinking it was Doki Doki for an hour. And then just getting blindsided by that. You kind of know because they're so like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? I mean, that was kind of the way it felt. I'm like, yeah, all right, I get it, dude. Something's yes. gonna happen. Yes, I actually, to me, the thing that the, the thing that sold that scare was that it cut. It doesn't let you click on the text box. the The text is scrolling on the text box, and then it cuts before you click OK. So you're not expecting it, and it's right, right in your face. It's very again. I'll, I can. You said you did a deep dive. I could do my own deep dive on how much I enjoyed the game and why it's so smart. And by the way, it has localization jokes. It has fake bad localization in it because it's not from Japanese, but it has the same awkward clunky translations of things from Japanese in English to make you think it's translated from Japanese. So even he's even aware of, you know, like localization and lo trends in localization to kind of make fun of them. That's yeah. It's, yeah. A, it, it's wonderful. He's, he, he's what is he Brazilian? Something like that. Um, uh, so, but I don't know. I, I'm not actually yeah, sure. Something, I, yeah. Cause I love that when I, when I learned that too, I was like, wow, what a student of the craft, you know, yeah. um, mm -hmm. really good shit. So I want to ask, um, a little bit about where we stand now. Mm -hmm. So my thesis is that websites are dying. It's happening 
slower than I thought. And yeah, I make fun. That's why I remember what I was saying. Now we were, it'll all be cut out, but I was, we were, we got, we got sidetracked. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the website Fanbyte, I like to make fun of their schmucks over there. And they, one of them actually tweeted out and I thought this was crazy. They were like, we need to hit a traffic goal this month. Please click on the link and just click around, click whatever you want. Don't read it. Just like click whatever you want. And I was like, this is insane. If I were in it, I'm not a tattletale, so I'm not going to bring attention to this shit. Yeah. But I was like, if I'm an asshole, I'm going to bring this to all of your advertisers and say like um, all of the um, whatever you're paying for, you know, um, your clicks. You should know that they're basically farming at this point. And I just found that so brazen and such a sign of the times. Nothing brings me more pleasure since these people threw me out like a piece of garbage for no reason. Um, after years of friendship and and camaraderie, um, nothing brings me more pleasure than eating their lunch. <laughs> and so I'm curious what you think about the the potential of what's happening right now, and where do you think things are going to go from here as far as games coverage and. Um, if politics are to blame for its undoing, because I actually think that the politicization, the TDS, as it's called in politics, the Trump derangement syndrome, I think has undone games journalism as we know it. And I, I think it didn't have to necessarily happen. I think they allowed it to happen. Once politics became the cool thing to talk about in every arena, people who wrote for niche type stuff thought, OK, if I if if I want to matter. I need to talk about politics and politics is such a big thing. And yeah, yeah, Trump was a big part of that. And so the idea was like, how can I, uh, how can I bring uh, racial politics into my food writing? That, that was, for example, uh, an area that is, that we're not uh, members of where politics became pervasive. Food blogging, all of this idea of like Noah Rothman uh, has a, uh, his new book, uh, also deals with this partly about the idea of like, who can cook what, who's a, which races are allowed to cook what and, right. Oh, look, this food truck sells Korean food, but the person there isn't even Korean cancel them. There was a lot of that. No cultural fusion. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. A lot of that stuff. And uh, yeah. And how dare you do a recipe that has this or that lots of food bloggers got mega canceled for really no reason at all. Um, and the, and yeah, the idea was that the idea was if I just write about food, nobody's going to care. My name's not going to be out there. I'm not going to get shared. And now a lot of hiring practices say like, how many followers do you have on social media? Because it, that helps direct traffic and stuff. I need to build my own brand. And the way to build my own brand is to say something that's in the arena that's hotly discussed. And for several years now, the arena that's hotly discussed was politics. And so every gaming person wanted to write about the sexism and the racism and the white supremacy. And, you know, and so everything's going to be about that. Uh, there, there might be a pendulum swing. You know, the thing is a lot of people branched off and did their own thing, right? YouTubers and sub stacks and all kinds of stuff like that. The question is whether or not at some point, some places will say, maybe we should just write about gaming. <laughs> You know, maybe right. we should be the place that doesn't do the politics. Stuff. And there are a couple of places that I think are doing it um, pretty well. Video Games Chronicle in particular is a really great website um, that I always pimp um, because they they are all about that. You know? And there are people also who, you know, even if they work within that kind of sphere, who tend to stay more on topic. Um, but the problem is, like you said, that that you you need to. It, it's weird. It's almost like the politics of old, where you need you. There's like propriety. You got to maintain this like image of propriety. There was a, a, a controversy that happened recently with you. I actually, if if we want to get into it, I actually became buddies with Gene Park because of the thing that happened with you and Gene oh, yeah. Park. Yeah. We were always kind of like uh, snipey and mean to each other. And then after that thing happened with you, I was like, wow, that's that's kind of bullshit. And he basically said, thank you. And I said, you know, we kind of used to not like each other. And he said, yeah, who cares? Let's and and we've been really friendly ever since like that. The fact that he got shit from people opened the door for us to become friendly with each other, for example. And that's that's a little microcosm to this whole thing. You know, every cancellation is an ex you know is an opportunity to make new friends to make new business opportunities to maybe start a new company you know do something like that Definitely. and i think yeah and i think a lot of good was born into the world from that yeah well said and i'm so glad to hear that because um i was really intrigued to hear about gene too and and actually there's been some 
controversy with Gene even since just recently. Gene, of course, was diagnosed with colon cancer, which is horrible, and we're wishing him the very best. Yes, absolutely. And I'm figuring out behind the scenes how I might be able to help him most uh, keenly. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what we can do for him. Um, but he uh, he even tweeted out that he went out with T- Taylor Lorenz, right? Who's an notor- infamous character in in many areas. But the the point is, is that he's allowed to be friends with people. You're allowed to be friends with them. You're allowed to disagree about things. You can even make the assumption that he might know Taylor Lorenz a lot better than you do. And you might be wrong about it. Right. And I'm saying that the royal you and all of the rest. And I think that that's what makes people so dynamic and interesting. I always think if you just lined up, let's say you took everyone from Kotaku, all the Muppets that work there. Right. And you just lined them all up and you said, what do you disagree with each other about? And I'm not talking about games or anything. Like, let's talk about the things you love the most, politics, society, all that. Do you disagree with each other about anything? Like anything at all? Like could, could there be some sort of interesting debate or op-ed that could be written, some angle, some some more adversarial crossfire type podcast, like anything at all? And I think they're just, they just dropped the ball. And I, I, I would be really embarrassed if I were these people at these various websites because they are overseeing these websites' destruction. Imagine being handed IGN and all that comes with it and all the history and all the work and toil that went into building that and then fucking it up. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, you know, I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the Taylor Lorenz thing because I didn't want to tweet about it. Uh, cause he, what, cause what you're referring to is that, uh, he then came later and said like, you know, I can't even tweet about being friends with someone mm-hmm. and not getting shit about it. Now, my opinions on Taylor Lorenz are very, no, very known. And I saw his tweet with her and I just said, yeah, whatever. I hate her. They're friends. What am I going to do? Give him a hard time for having lunch with his friend? Like, I don't care. But no, but some people had even, I guess, people who don't, because if whatever, if you like him and he is friends with someone that you don't like, you it's okay to just like grumble about it quietly. Like, I don't know. Sometimes a thought can stay a thought. I often say some tweets are best, uh, are, are better served as a text to your therapist. Yes, you know, definitely. Instead of putting or, it in the Twitter box, <laughs> just text it to your therapist. Or do I mean I had to do it? I just was like, it's it's. I think it was October la- um, last year where I was like, I'm just not doing this anymore. I'm just not posting on here anymore unless it's a- unless it's an advertisement for a show because yeah. it's just too. It's too human, not the game. It's just too human out there. Where <laughs> um, Twitter become human? Yeah, exactly. Where exactly where. <laughs> It's just you put yourself out there. I don't even get annoyed by the insults. People have said every insult possible in the world to me. They told me they're going to kill me. They told me they're going to find me, all this stuff. That stuff doesn't really get me. It actually kind of goes to your point where like people are like getting all crazy about Internet threats and all these things. And I've been there. I've had one stalker in particular that I was worried about. But people have said heinous things to me. I don't I don't take it particularly, um, particularly seriously. I guess I, I guess I just want to I'm getting off. The, I get I'm getting off the beaten path. I want to get back on the path. I want to ask you as we close about um, where we stand now in terms of culture with games and its potential to further influence the political realm. Since politics seems to have influenced games in that one direction, I wonder if games will ever come back and be to the benefit of politics. I wonder if you feel like there'll be further interchange between these two spheres and how you might look at them. Well, I, I mean, I, I do think that uh, uh, just quality art, because the thing about people say politics and games, what they mean isn't that there shouldn't be any political message. People don't like being talked at and in very uh, direct terms. A political message can be uh, delivered uh, not even subtly. It can be very blunt, but it doesn't have to be very clumsy and it doesn't have to be very annoying, and it, it doesn't have to be uh, current thingism, because we are somewhat obsessed with current thingism. And so instead of like saying, I'm going to uh, make something that's, uh, you know, like uh, criticizing bigotry in general, it's all about like, I'm going to make a very subtle allusion to Donald Trump specifically. And then, and so, yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean that your art is ineffective, but you're, you might sacrifice landing with some people by being uh very subtle uh, like not very subtle in in it, w- once the once the art sounds like the person talking through the art you start to lose people i think 
you need the art to talk with its own voice. If I can hear the creator's voice speaking with like the character's mouth, then I'm then I feel preached at. I feel like it's not. He didn't create a piece of art that has its own voice. He's just using it as a mask for his or her or their own voice. Um, and so, yeah, good art and art that is actually free from the stresses of that, of like, what are they going to say that I'm not, this isn't woke enough or this isn't whatever enough art that's kind of free from those stresses usually has the space to be more influential, to say more important things. It's very well said. I think my favorite sort of criticism, and I'm sure you can agree, is the criticism wherein a product, in this case, a game doesn't say what they want you to say or doesn't say what they wanted it to say. Far Cry 5 is always the example for me. They wanted, for some reason, Far Cry 5 to be this total commentary on Donald Trump. They thought it was going to be that because it took place in Montana and it was about a, a religious cult. It wasn't any of those things. It actually humanized people in that area of the country and um, they weren't having it. And I always found that criticism interesting where it's you're not criticizing what's there. You're criticizing what you think should be there instead not as a supplement, but as a replacement. And that's not criticism. That's just stupid. That that that, that serves no purpose. Um, and so I agree with you. And, and I say this to the audience all the time. Politics belongs with games. Politics belongs with video games, the creation of them, um, the economics and social implications of games, the stories and the, the potential of historical stories and future history and all of these different things that they can do and tell. It's amazing. It's just been bastardized by this very one-sided and narrow uh, uh, view of what political commentary is. And it's through racial lenses. It's through all these different lenses. And people, I think, are not are, are becoming tired of that in general. And so I hope that that plays out in games. I always tell the audience, too, and, and you probably agree. I'm like, the big problem is is class. And it's and it's class is everything. And, and no one wants to talk about that. They want to talk about immutable characteristics. And I think it sucks. And um, a really op eye opening experience for me, although it was really more of an experience for my girlfriend, my girlfriend's black and um, people talk shit about me on the Internet all the time. And someone said to her at some point, like, you know, you're, you, you know, Colin's a fucking racist and all these things. And she was like, who are you to tell me that the person I know is racist? It, 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 what do you think that says about what you think about me? Like what you I, think I, about my intellect, my ability, my agency. Yeah, I remember even when I was a small anonymous anime account, seeing people discuss me with such authority as though they knew not only knew me, but were very confident in their ability to analyze my uh, personality based on my tweets. Yeah, like just the, the utter conviction that they totally have me uh, pinned down. Uh, is very is very weird sometimes, and yeah, like you said, and not only that, it's never subtle. It's always like this guy's the worst. Mm -hmm. This guy, now I don't know. I I just read his tweets, but I can confidently tell you all of these things about his personality, and they're all really really bad. And then yeah, it's um, it becomes so it becomes like this out of control Venn diagram where you're looking for the overlap between a bunch of different circles and you realize you've just kind of fucked yourself out of any sort of connection with anyone because you've alienated yourself from everybody. I just think it, it works in reverse. And I, I just think, uh, the immutable characteristic stuff really, really has to go. Like it really, 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 really does. And it's, it's just too much for me because it, we see, well, it's, it's, a, it's a lot in star Wars. I don't, like Star Wars, really, I don't pay attention to Star Wars, but I just see it always rearing its ugly head in Star Wars where people don't like Rose, you're racist. People don't like this black chick on Obi-Wan that apparently is just very underdeveloped. You're racist. It's like it, it makes it, it, it no one's able to have any sort of real criticism about the subject matter or the underlying message or the story or the writing or. And the even bigger, the even bigger problem is that uh, I think there's a, a step, a pre step to this that people don't talk about, which is that. The laziness of saying, oh, we want the, you know, like the Disney people of saying we want this movie to be more diverse. Just put a, just throw a couple of like non-white characters in there, half cook them. Doesn't matter if they're important or if they're interesting or whatever, because we just need a, a diverse cast. And yeah, if, and if China complains, we can cut them out because they don't fill enough screen time. And so then when people say this character suck, they say, obviously you don't like the non-white characters, but it's like, yeah, but you're also 
you're 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 the one who's casting non-white people in all the most boring roles or like you know because you know uh, john boyega got a good role they were teasing him as he was going to be one of the two big protagonists of the thing people were super into that and then they just went like nah fuck it we're going to take him out of the posters in china and we're going to reduce him to like a, co- a comic relief and in the third movie all he does is runs around going ray yeah ray! for no reason and he hated it he hate he like he talked shit about disney after that and it was like yeah don't don't call us racist because you cast non-white people in in crap roles like give them better roles yeah they 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 chose wrong with the two protagonist possibilities (laughs) in that i mean uh, i i i I thought there was a lot they could have done i thought there was a lot of good groundwork that was laid there that they could have they could have like worked off of but then they they just kind of didn't i don't know i'm trying to analyze the thought process behind uh what lucas was doing is uh like lucas film i mean is uh it's i've just i've given up i don't understand none of it makes sense to me like financially (laughs) Yeah, it, it mean I don't I refuse to even watch any of it. N- none of it. I'm not watching any of that shit. So, but it's just it just um it brings to the to the fore like you said, this idea that we used to argue I don't know, we used to argue about the subject matter and the substance. And I hope we can get back to that because that's what makes crit- criticism fun, that's what makes gaming fun, that's what makes the intersection of politics and gaming fun. That's why I can't wait to see what Six Days in Fallujah is all about, for instance, when that game finally comes out, because it's like, okay, cool. Let's tell us your story and let's judge it based on what it is, not the idea that it exists. That's insanity. So, um, well, anyway, Noam, I, cr- I appreciate you being here today, my friend. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, first of all, I hope you can come back. I-, I like to offer this to a few people when they're here, and certainly I want to offer this to you. If you're playing a game that you think we're playing or whatever, you should come on for a spoiler cast or a review discussion because every big release, basically, we do a, a deep dive podcast on. So it'd be fun to have you back in the gaming capacity. Um, but I, I wanted to thank you and, mm-hmm. and give you an opportunity to pimp out your wares if you want people to be able to find you online. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this was great. And uh, yeah, I have a I have a podcast called Ambitious Crossover Attempt that you can find on Twitter at A-M-B-X over A-M-B-X-O-V-E-R. It's on all of your podcast catchers and stuff. Uh, I'm Neon Taster on Twitter. And yeah, my YouTube is youtube.com slash C slash Neon Taster. And my Twitch is twitch.tv slash Neon Taster. I'm actually playing Tunic right now. Nice. Um, Before that, I played Haiku the Robot, which is a really fun Metroidvania made by one guy. Kickstarted and made by one guy. Really fun game. Uh, I'm also, I might be streaming tonight. uh, I backed on Kickstarter uh, a Metroidvania called Crow Sworn. And they put out their first like backer demo that you can play if you're a backer at the tier that I am. And so I might stream that tonight. Nice. Yeah, we're kindred there, too, because Metroidvania is one of my favorite genres for sure. Um, so I'll have to check those out. Tunic looks so good. I'm waiting for it to come. I'm very partisan when I play. I, we have everything, but I like to play for my trophies. So I'm waiting for it to come to PlayStation in September. <laughs> but that game, that game looks fantastic. Game Pass continues to get these really impressive games. In fact, my last two game of the years were Game Pass games because it was a uh, outriders was my game of the year last year and what was it before oh. that it was a game pass game too but um oh no but it's this year nobody saves the world that was a game oh, pass okay. game as well and that oh, was yeah. really cool too so a lot of good stuff over there but you're very welcome back here it was fun to finally get to talk to you um i appreciate it and um yeah we'll 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 talk more I'm, we'll, we'll interact more I, but definitely people love when we have people back and they can talk about games so we'll, we'll definitely oh, sure. we got all that shit it. out of the way yeah, we could do new games. We could do old games, whatever. I'm all, I'm always I'm always down for that. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you, and I appreciate all of you out there as well. Thank you for supporting us. Patreon.com slash Last Stand Media, the biggest fan-funded games podcast in the history of the world because of you. We appreciate it. Um, Defining Duke, Sacred Symbols, knock back all of the rest. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.